Hi, in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about bright line emission spectra, or how the elements we have determine the colors that we see. So let's go. Let's talk about bright line emission spectra. So a bright line spectrum is formed when atoms absorb energy and their electrons move into higher energy levels. These electrons become very unstable, they can't stay that way, and so they then lose this energy by emitting light when they return back down to their lower energy levels. This is the way that virtually all visible light where energy is provided into a system like light bulbs, um, when we're talking about fluorescent light bulbs in particular, or neon signs, or the light coming from stars, or even fireworks. It's where all of this comes from. So for example, if we have a photon of energy being absorbed into the atom I am showing you here, which by the way is what element? Here's a hint, one proton, one electron, this would be good old hydrogen or the standard isotope of hydrogen, protium. And we're in our ground state. We're absorbing one photon of energy and that causes the electron to jump up one energy level into an excited state. Notice that that ground state energy level where it originated, the very first orbital closest to the nucleus is now empty. As that happens, that becomes unstable. The atom is now unstable. The electron cannot maintain this level of energy and it will release that energy as a photon of light that we can then see when it returns back to its ground state. This is something I'm going to stress over and over and over. The light is actually produced not on the way up as we absorb energy, but it's produced on the way down when we release that energy as light. So when you shine a light through a prism and it breaks that light into the visible spectrum, you're seeing the individual wavelengths of light. When we look at the light emitted from a single element, you're not going to potentially see that entire spectrum of Roy G. Biv covers, colors that we've gotten used to seeing. You're going to see only the specific colors that are emitted by the electrons getting excited in that element. So the light emitted by atoms consists of a mixture of only specific frequencies of light generated by the photons from its excited electrons. We're not going to see the entire visible spectra here. And in fact, some of the light emitted by these electrons is not visible at all. Remember, we can have very low energy light that goes beyond our realm of the visible spectrum. We can also have very high energy light that goes beyond the realm of our visible spectrum. Remember, you've got um, ultraviolet, which is very high energy light that goes above the spectrum in violet. And you also have infrared, which is very low energy light, which goes below the energy emitted from red light. Both of those can be emitted, but we're not ever going to be able to visualize them with our eyes. So these frequencies of light correspond to specific colors. And when we're looking at a bright line spectrum, these colors form bands that we will be able to see. Each element has a unique pattern of bands which can be used to identify it. In fact, sometimes the bright line spectra for an element is known as its electron fingerprint or its atomic fingerprint. And uh, we're gonna look at a few of those now. We often call this the emission spectra for that element. So if we have an atom and we supply energy to that atom and it absorbs that energy and the electrons get excited, when they fall back down to their original energy level, they are going to emit that energy as light. But the color of light that they're emitting completely depends on the amount of energy that was first absorbed 
in order to get them to the excited state and that is then emitted as they fall back down to their ground state. So for example here we see one electron falling from its excited state back down to ground but it only moved one level and perhaps it's releasing a very low energy wavelength of light in the red range because it only absorbed a small amount of energy to get up to that first level. But in order to go up two levels we must absorb two quantas of energy which is double the energy that was absorbed to move one level and when that electron falls back down to its ground state the energy emitted from its fall or the photon emitted is going to be a much higher energy photon in this case up in the blue light range so the colors that are emitted completely correspond to the distance that those electrons are falling to go back down to their ground state so in this case this atom when it's excited whatever this element is we would see two colors of light being emitted by these two possible distances falling in the energy levels Let's take this a little bit further. If we have four possible excited states where we have four different levels of energy being absorbed by those electrons on their way up and thus being released by those electrons on their way down, we're going to see four different colors of light corresponding to the amounts of energy that those electrons absorbed on their way to their excited state. So the amount of energy absorbed will always equal the amount of energy that is released all those rules of matter and energy are still applying here. If we have an excited lithium atom that absorbs a certain amount of energy and then it falls back to its ground state, um, we're emitting a photon of red light because we only moved one energy level down. If we look at different elements, those light bands that they're going to emit, those frequencies of light are going to be different for each element. And we can use them to identify the different elements. In fact, this is how we can generally figure out what elements or gases are in different stars. We can look at the light that is emitted, look at them through a spectrometer, a spectrometer, um, or a spectroscope, which is something we're going to talk about in just a moment, that splits the light into those discrete bands, and we can match it up with the known elements that emit those bands of light. It's actually really quite clever. These are called line spectra. They're absolutely unique to each element. They are sometimes also called emission spectra, once again, going into our vocabulary, and the light is emitted or given off during emission spectra. Um, so if each element has a unique bright line emission spectrum, we can treat this like it's atomic fingerprint. So for example, this is the bright line emission spectra for helium. You can see we have a bright red band, a slightly um, more faint band in the reddish orange range, quite a bright band in yellow, another one over here in yellow, we have a few in the green range going up into blue, and then finally into violet. So why do we have so many colors when helium only has two electrons? Well, remember, there are many different ways that those electrons can get excited. They can move up one level, they can move up two, they can move up three. And you have all these possibilities creating all these different colors of light that we see for that element. So we can explore these by looking at gas discharge tubes. A gas discharge tube is a closed glass tube that contains a single gas or a mixture of gases and two electrodes sealed inside it. And when an electric charge is applied through it, it will glow. This is essentially the way that neon lights work. And we've looked at a few gas discharge tubes in class or we will soon. A spectroscope, on the other hand, is used to see those discrete colors of light that are emitted by the atoms when they get excited. So it has a prism inside and it allows that light to be split into the discrete wavelengths. It works kind of like this. This would be our gas discharge tube, um, specifically for hydrogen in this case. The light is being emitted. It goes through a card or some type of um, focusing device that has a tiny little slit in it that makes all the light come through in one single very thin line. It then goes through a prism that splits that light into the visible spectrum that we can see. So here, 
in hydrogen, for example, we have one band at about uh, 410 nanometers. That's the wavelength of light. Here we have another one at 434 nanometers, a third in the green range at 486 nanometers, and finally one up here in red at 656 nanometers. Remember, the longer the wavelengths are, the lower the energy is in that color of light. That's why the red range has a larger number because the energy is lower as the wavelengths get longer or kind of lazier. We also have continuous line spectra. Here, this is the full visible um, range of light, but when we look at hydrogen, we only see a few bands. Sodium, we see many more. There are more electrons involved. In calcium, we have even more bands. And these are, once again, specific for every individual element. Here's mercury. Mercury, we can see we've got a lot down here in the blue and green range, a few up in the red and orange range. So every element has a unique range. Every element has a unique set of bands that correspond to the specific wavelengths of light produced by its electrons when they get excited. It was actually a British astrophysicist named Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. I hope I pronounced that right. Working at the Harvard Observatory, that actually discovered what elements were in the sun in 1925. And she used bright line emission spectra and a very sophisticated for her time spectrophotometer to determine the composition of our nearest star. Thanks, Cecilia. So Cecilia Payne actually had some amazing quotes. Um, one of them was about having a career in science. And I, I just wanna share it with you because I think it's kind of great. She said, um, young people, especially young women, often ask me for advice. Here it is, valiant quantum. Do not undertake a scientific career in quest of fame or money. There are far easier and better ways to reach them. Undertake it only if nothing else will satisfy you. For nothing else is probably what you will receive. Your reward will be the widening of the horizon as you climb. And if you achieve the reward, you will ask no other. Kind of incredible. And she was 25, 25 years old when she discovered that the sun was made of helium and hydrogen. And she made so many observations of all the other stars. She's largely considered one of the most influential women in science. I mean, she was one of the first women professors at Harvard, certainly. But did you know her name? Probably not. We can use this to identify gases or unknown substances in a mixture. For example, if we look here, we have an unknown mixture at the bottom in this problem. This is actually straight out of a region's problem. And we have four different gases. If we want to figure out which gases are in that mixture, we need to look at the lines that are representing the different colored bands from that um, individual gas or individual element. And you need all of the bands from each element to appear in the mixture to say they're there. So for example, let's look at gas A. If we line up the bands in gas A with the bands in the unknown mixture, we can see that every band in gas A also appears in the unknown mixture. But there are bands in the unknown mixture that are not in gas A. That's fine. It means they must come from one of the other gases. Let's look at gas B. Gas B definitely can't be in the unknown mixture. If we look just at those first two bands that appear close together in gas B, they appear nowhere in the unknown mixture. So they're definitely excluded from being in our unknown mixture. If we look at gas C, once again, the very first band on the left that we see, it doesn't appear in the unknown mixture, so it cannot be present. And let's go finally to gas D. Gas D, we have three bands. All three of those bands appear in the unknown mixture. So our unknown mixture must be a mix of gas A and gas D. Here's one for you to try. We have an unknown sample at the top. There are four elements underneath. Which of those four elements appear in the unknown sample?
So in this case, our elements that appear in the unknown sample are elements B and elements C. If we look at element B and element C, all of their bands also appear in the unknown sample. If we look at element A and element D, their bands do not all appear in the unknown sample, and thus they cannot be a part of that mixture. We can use this once again to identify different elements. If we do a flame test, which is a lab we're going to be looking at later on in this unit, we can see different colors being emitted by heating up different elements or supplying them energy. And then you can see the distinct pattern of bands or colors that are produced by each of those elements. Those unique colors, they're not just theoretical, however, we can use them in lots of different ways. One of them you might enjoy every summer, and that would be in fireworks. When we look at fireworks, all of those colors, when we look at fireworks, all of the colors you see in those fireworks are produced by the presence of different metallic salts in the firework charges themselves. So how does a firework, well, work? So what goes into a firework? If you were to open up a firework, you would see um, multiple different pellets that are made of different chemicals that give us the different colors in the firework itself. Now, most fireworks are constructed in a way that they go off in multiple bursts. If that happens, we have time delay fuses that are in the central fuse that causes there to be a slight lag between when the charges in each section explode. Usually the colors are separated by cardboard dividers that allow the distinct colors to appear when each charge is set off. At the bottom of the firework, there's a lift charge that's really set off by a fast burning side fuse that's part of the main fuse that gives it the power to lift off into the sky before it bursts into all its different colors and all their glory. So what chemicals make these different colors in fireworks? Well, bright yellows, those come from sodium. Um, the bright pink colors that you see, those are usually from lithium. Those are one of my favorites. Strontium gives you a brilliant red, barium, an amazing grass green. Copper gives you all sorts of different shades from blue to green, depending on what it's mixed with. You see those white hot ones, those are magnesium. And if you ever see the tiny, whoops, if you ever see the tiny little sparkles that kind of rain down, those are going to be made actually with iron filings. That's the exact same component that's in your sparklers if you've ever used a sparkler at home. So those fireworks are 100% the result of chemistry. Fourth of July, Bastille Day, your cousin's birthday. Thank you, chemistry. So there are lots of different um, chemicals that can give different special effects as well. For example, um, white smoke, um, that comes from potassium nitrate combined with sulfur. Um, if you hear that kind of a whistling noise, that comes from potassium benzoate when they take off and they go, that was a really bad whistle, um, or sodium salicylate. There's all sorts of special effects that go into the chemistry of fireworks, which are also some of the chemistry of colors. Paint gets its color from chemicals. Um, if you've ever seen beautiful colored glass, like in a stained glass window, that's because of chemicals, specific metallic salts that are added to the glass when it's melted or made molten that then create the colors that you see. For example, the most beautiful red glass that you can imagine is actually the result of gold or gold salts being added to the glass when it's made. A dark, vibrant blue, well, that's cobalt. Chemicals, chemistry, it's all around you. So that wraps up our discussion of bright line spectra and the elements that are involved in their production. In our next video, we're going to be talking about ions how they relate to atoms, and just what happens when you steal electrons from something or try to shove some extras in there. Thanks.